The London and Middlesex Archaeological Society holds talks on London's past every month. Check out our event listings on the website at www.lamas.org.uk. That's me. <laughs> um, well, it's a great pleasure, a real great pleasure, to be back on what I always regard as home turf. Uh, I haven't been here now for six years, but um, I've been in and out quite a lot, so I still feel this is, this is home. Now, I would just say that I hope you can all see the screen, because it's quite low and it's quite small. And I've got one or two distribution maps, but I was kind of aware that it was low and it was small, so I've made them big. So <laughs> hopefully they will come across. Now, what I want to do this evening is I want to give you, um, I suppose, three case studies, um, which will lead us in to perhaps open up some wider questions. So I want to use three finds, if you like, that have come into the museum over the last few years and unpack their context and try and put them in a, a rather bigger picture. So those of you who've heard me speak before, and I, I think I probably know about half the audience by first name, um, you've heard me speak. The first bit of the talk is a kind of intro about the river and the finds from it, the problems we have in engaging with those finds. Um, and that's really, really important because there is a lot of difficulty dealing with these river finds. As any of us, and there are a few of us in the audience who've struggled with these river finds, we're only too well aware just the limitations of the evidence. So the first bit of the talk looks at the limitations. Then I go into these three case studies, which I hope will unpack some of the bigger questions. All right? So on that basis, let's make a start. Let's introduce the star of the show. The <laughs> now, here are some iconic images of the river, and you can put your own captions, particularly to the one on the bottom right. Um, two gentlemen engaged in Brexit negotiations, I think, ahead of the, uh, uh, ahead of the um, thing the other year. Um, but basically what's going on here is the river provides a platform for uh, performance, for pageantry, for power, and for protest and also for propitiation, as we'll come on to in a bit. So these are kind of iconic images which we all, I suspect, as Londoners, carry in our heads when we think of the Thames. And I won't go through them. You, you can see well enough what they all mean. But over the last few years, and certainly in 2014, the picture of the Thames is not so much these iconic sort of tourist images, but these rather more gripping images which speak to flood, tidal surge, uh, environmental and climatic change. And the pictures here, the, the one in the middle is uh, the Thames at Shepparton in the winter of 2014, which turned into a series of lakes interspersed with small islands and islets. Uh, not a good time to be living in Shepparton. Not a good time to be shopping in Asda in Twickenham either, as the lady with the little dog in the bottom right can testify. <laughs> She's having to wade from her X5 uh, into, the, into the supermarket. Slightly wider pictures, we've got the Dawlish, the loss of the, the main West, London, main West Country line down in Dawlish that fell away that same winter. And, of course, Private Eye's unique take on the Environment Minister's visit to Somerset <laughs> to assure them that everything's going fine. The, the caption actually says, it's all under control. <laughs> the slide, though, at the top left of the screen gives us a hint, though, that that 2014 uh, episode of flooding was not unique. The Thames has flooded time out of mind. And that particular picture shows a family being evacuated from a basement flat in Lambeth in 1928. Fourteen people were killed, drowned in basement flats, uh, and three to four thousand made homeless. So... This is a, there's, there's a long history of flooding, and I want, to, I want to come back to flooding at the end, and the ways in which prehistoric communities may have tried to deal with it, try to uh, sort of ameliorate its effects. Now, so bear, bear these pictures in mind, because we'll come back to this point towards the end of the talk. 
Now we're all Londoners here, I think I can fairly say that without fear of contradiction, yes? Now I'm, of course, a proud South Londoner, and I suspect there'll be people here equally proud North Londoners. But it's a, a point to make that Londoners, by and large, chart their way round their capital city by recourse to the river. You're North or you're South, essentially. And it's no, there's no greater, no sharper contrast amongst the football, footballing fraternity. <laughs> and I always feel, I always feel that the peculiar animosity between Tottenham and Arsenal is because, of course, Arsenal started off as Woolwich Arsenal, a South London team who moved north of the river into Tottenham territory at the start of the First World War. Uh, the fact that the munitions workers set up their team over the river, north of the river. Now, I worked for the museum here for 33 years or thereabouts, and I always felt slightly odd coming over the river. It was always slightly foreign territory. Um, in much the same way, you know, you ask a South London cabbie to go north, or a North London cabbie to go south. The point is, the river still exerts a grip on Londoners. But there's another equally interesting division in terms of the river, an upriver and a downriver split, a tidal river and a non-tidal river. And these two images encapsulate that. The slide on the left is um, Edward John uh, Gregory's uh, lovely picture um, of, and I always get the name of this place right, it's not Bovley. Um, sorry? Bolters. Bolters, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Bolters Lock, Sunday afternoon. This was a painting that took Gregory 15 years to complete. He started it in 1882, and he finished it in 1897. And it encapsulates for me that upriver, sort of Sunday supplement, sunny afternoon sort of feel. Um, you can't look at that picture without thinking of Jerome K. Jerome's Three Men in a Boat, which was published in 1888, right in the middle of when he was painting this picture. So this is the, this is the upriver, the sort of Sunday idyll, if you like. Downriver, of course, the tidal river, you've got a rather different feel. It's a river uh, of politics, of trade, uh, of industry, um, and of danger. And this is a picture in this museum's collection. This is Nevinson's picture, uh, simply called uh, Winter 1928. And it's taken the viewpoint, you're at the sort of south end of Waterloo Bridge, looking downstream towards St Paul's in the city. Now, there's a nice story behind this particular picture, uh, painted in 1928, and he, the artist said that he remembered being taken into London as a small boy at a time when there was a huge freeze on the Thames in 1895, a really, really heavy freeze, and Londoners were astonished to see seagulls flying around the Thames, something they'd not been used to seeing, and he felt he had to encapsulate, take that into this picture. So those, we've got this north-south divide, but an east-west tidal non-tidal divide. And that, again, I think is crucial to understanding the prehistory of the river. And it's a point I'll come back to in a, in, a, in, a, in a little while. Now, the Thames functioned in various ways for the communities who lived along its banks. It was a shaper of landscape. And that slide there, um, the uh, uh, Trafalgar Square, if you stand in Trafalgar Square, down by the fountains, you're on one bed of the river, and you're looking up towards the National Gallery, which is on another terrace of the river. So you've essentially got the river moulding, shaping the landscape in the London region, encapsulated, as I say, by Trafalgar Square. So we've got a shaper of landscape. We've got the river as a provider of resources, uh, water, food, um, raw materials, flint, timber, rushes, all that sort of stuff. We've got the river as an artery of communication, providing a very clear point of movement in from across the channel up into the heart of southern lowland Britain, and the Thames as a boundary. And the gentleman standing in the river there, you might not be able to see him, those of you at the back, but believe you me, there is a chap standing in the river looking rather nervously downstream. That's Rufus Lord Noel Buxton. The year is 1952. He's attempting to demonstrate that there was a ford at Westminster which sees a cross. And he's going to walk across there at low tide. Now he figures that he's six foot two inches tall. The river at low tide there should be five foot six inches. He should get across. Well, you know he didn't. He had to swim, <laughs> he had to swim for it. 
He had to swim for it. He'd reckoned without the deep water dredge channel, which runs down the centre of the river. And he was hauled out on the far side by the speaker. It's what, it's what Labour peers did after the war. So we've got the Thames as shaper, Thames as provider, artery, boundary, and in the middle there, the Thames as potentially uh, a sacred stream at various times at various places, which into which have been placed fabulous, fabulous artefacts, often the very best of their type, the completest, the finest, the most martial, the most powerful objects were consigned to the river. Now, I want to come back to this piece in the, at the end of the talk. To me, in all the time that I worked at the museum, this is the single finest piece of lithic material to come into this museum out of the river. It's a fantastic object, and I'll, I'll come back to that right at the end. So we've got all those sort of different elements now, the way the river functioned. How do we come by all those objects which fill the museum? Not only this museum, but Reading Museum, the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, they've all got large collections of dredged material. And it's dredging that is crucial to our understanding of uh, the objects and the difficulties uh, of interpreting what those objects might mean. Because the river authorities, Thames Conservancy, um, the Port of London Authority, etc., etc., were all charged with one thing, the maintenance of the navigation. They had to maintain the river as a highway. And that involved repeated dredging and the removal of obstructions like fish, fish weirs, flash locks, all those sorts of things. Ayats had to be removed because they, they, they held up the navigation. So what you've got here... In the old days, back in, back in the pre-1820 period, you've got the river being dredged by hand with these spoon and bucket dredgers, they're, they're known as. It's basically a large child's fishing net with an iron hoop on the end of it, which is dug down into the riverbed and heaved up by sheer brute force by a chap who then tips it into the lighter. After the 1820s, you get the whole thing speeded up by steam dredgers. And there's a whole series of steam dredgers working the Thames. They've got lovely names, um, Hercules, Goliath, Samson. And these things can shift about 20,000 tonnes of gravel from the riverbed a week. What they're doing is, and this, this is a nice picture again, um, this is Clarkson Stanfield picture of a Thames dredger at work off the tower. So there's the Tower of London. We're deep in the heart of the, uh, in the city here. The steam dredger is dredging it up. It's coming up on this re revolving bucket, tipped into a lighter, which is moored alongside. So all that river gravel is being dumped into a lighter. Then these chaps who are right at the bottom of the pyramid, these are the ballast heavers. Now they're the people who have to transfer the gravel by hand from those lighters into ships needing stiffening up in the Pool of London. And by and large, these are colliers, because they're bringing in sea coal to London. These chaps are badly paid. They're usually in hop to local publicans. They're usually earning about 10 bob a week. One of the perquisites they're allowed is objects found in the gravel. So what these chaps are very quickly doing is realising that there's a market here. There's money to be made from taking objects they find in their, in their gravel and selling them moving them onto the market. But it does create problems in terms of how do you, where, where does this gravel come from? If you've got a steam dredger working a long stretch of the river, where is the fine spot? And quite often you find that you have uh, provenance is given as Thames London. Well, what does that mean? Or Thames Brentford. Well, Brentford's quite a long stretch. Or Thames Long Reach, which as its name implies, is a long reach. It's about two miles long. So where on there do you, do you locate your, your provenance? So you can begin to see that there are real difficulties actually dealing with a lot of this stuff. Of course, you then have these, these ballast heavers selling things into the market. Collectors are usually very acquisitive, usually very competitive. And we have very large numbers of them active in the London area in the sort of late Victorian, mid to late Victorian period and onwards. People like um, Thomas Layton of Kew, um, who amassed an enormous collection of material, which he stored in his house. He filled his house top to bottom, four-storey house filled. 
He then thought, well, I've filled the house up. I'd better start putting things in the shed. <laughs> so he wrapped his finds up that he bought from these guys, put them in tea chests in his shed. By the time his executors broke into his premises uh, after his death in 1911, there were 31 sheds in his garden, <laughs> all full of stuff, packed in tea chests. Um, so you can understand, he'd been collecting over 60 years. Now, he probably labelled that stuff when he bought it, but 60 years in a damp garden shed doesn't do much good for uh, little labels stuck on objects. So quite a lot of the Leighton collection is unprovenant, sadly, although it's probably Thames, <coughs> West London. One of the great lost collections is that amassed by this chap, Dr. Frank Corner of Poplar, who Francis Shepherd describes as a peppery physician, or a, an irascible physician, um, who was dealing um, in antiquities, but collecting them in a very scientific way and, and keeping a very firm grip on the provenances. Now, the museum... Uh, under Guy Lakin, the London Museum, uh, managed to obtain from Corner during his life about 500 to 600 pieces, I suppose, of his, of his nicest objects. But a lot of them were still in his, uh, in, in, his, um, um, in his ownership on his death and were sold at Puttick and Simpson, as you can see here, 1948. Now, I've been through that catalogue and there are over 2,000 objects in that catalogue from the Thames many of them from Thames in East London. It's one of the great lost, one of the great tragedies that the corner collection has simply disappeared into the, into the trade. Um, we know not where a lot of this stuff is. We do know, though, where one of the finest pieces came from. It's that there. This is the bronze shield dredged out of the River Lee at Ponder's End. This, believe it or not, turned up in the Royal Ontario Museum uh, in Canada. It was bought by Dr. Curley directly from Corner. Um, although I suspect that this gentleman here, this is George Fabian Lawrence, G.F. Lawrence, Stony Jack. He may well have acted as a kind of go-between between Corner and the Royal Ontario Museum. Lawrence was described by Wheeler um, as, um, well, described by a lot of people actually, as an honest rogue. He was the guy behind the Cheapside hoard. Many of you will have seen the Cheapside exhibition here. He was the chap who was down the pub buying stuff off the workmen and not being too necessarily careful about um, ownership um, or uh, um, a, a, a sort of um, trespass. He was, um, he, was, he was more keen to get the objects. Um, mind you, Wheeler does say that but for Mr Lawrence, not a tithe of the objects in the museum's collections would have come down to us. They would have simply disappeared into private collections. So Lawrence, although he's a bit of an ambivalent figure, is a very, very important figure in understanding the finds from the river. Um, he was selling stuff all over the world. It's, it's all over the place. A lot of it, though, in this museum and also in the BM. Now, one of the things that um, this trading in antiquities led to was great competition and the splitting up of a number of very, very important objects, groups of objects. Case in point is the broad nests of spearheads dredged out of the Thames off Broadness in about 1911, split up into three groups and sold to different collectors. Corner got a chunk, um, Lloyd of West London got a chunk, and Canon William Greenwell of Durham got a chunk, um, usually through agents. Um, Greenwell was a rapacious collector as well um, and wasn't best pleased to find that he'd only been offered a third of the find. Um, there was quite a good deal of um, acerbic correspondence ensuing as a result. But there's a very interesting, it's, this is a whole sub-story here. But you can see the way that these objects also have formulated our understanding of London's prehistory. You've only got to go down to the London before London Gallery. That river wall that runs through the gallery, that blue-lit wall, which this is part, simply gives you a taste of the sheer quantity of material available to... Uh, for study in, in, in and around the London area. Um, and for many years, of course, it was the river finds that basically summed up London's prehistory. It's only in the last 20 to 25 years that field archaeology has begun to catch up and contextualise a lot of these river finds. And river finds still keep coming in, and they come in through, well, through the, the 
the, the work of people like Steve Brooker here from the Society of Thames Mudlarks, who bring a lot of material across, across the desk of the Portable Antiquities Scheme um, within the museum. And then, of course, you've got um, Gustav Milne and the Thames Discovery Program, now Citizen, that it's gone, it's gone nationwide, as it were, looking at the intertidal archaeology on the foreshores. It always used to be thought that that intertidal archaeology was pretty much unstratified. But the work of people like Gus um, and others on the foreshore has shown that that is far from the case, that we are dealing with a lot of stratified material down there, um, much of which is coming in through the, the, the guys of the Society of Thames Mudlarks and Thames and Field, those sort of people, under licence by the Port of London Authority, bring their finds in to be recorded at the museum. Now, that's, this is where we, we're beginning to get a grip on the provenance of this stuff. This is no longer dredged from some mile and a half reach of Thames. You now have a specific location, a provenance, uh, a context. And this is really, really valuable information that's coming to us now through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Um, and these are figures that put together by Ben Pates, who was part of the Portable Antiquities Scheme here at the museum, for a talk, in fact, he gave to Lammas Conference um, back in, well, 2015, I think. These are the figures that had come in through the scheme between 2003-2015. And you can see that we've got ooh, rising sort of five, six, seven, eight thousand objects individually recorded. The prehistoric material forms only a tiny proportion of that stuff, it's about eight percent. Eight percent of those objects are prehistoric. And of those, this large figure here, 365 for the Iron Age, a lot of that includes the entries from the Celtic coin index at Oxford. So that why that Iron Age figure is, is rather inflated. Of course, we're two years further on, these figures have increased. But you can begin to get a bit of a grip on just how much stuff is coming across the desk um, of the Portable Antiquities Scheme and Kate, uh, Kate Sutton here at the, at the museum. It's a very, very busy part of the museum's operation. But a very, very important part too. Now, this is Ben's distribution map of where all those finds come from, and you can see the yellow and the red are all from the river. So 95% of the objects coming into the museum through the Portable Antiquities Scheme are out of the river. It's an enormous quantity of stuff. And it's very difficult to get a, you know, keep, keep, a, keep a tab on it, as it were. How do we explain? How do we explain what these things are doing in the river? Well, there are various traditional explanations. Um, accidental loss. Battles at fords. Erosion of settlements or burials. And the current flavour of the month, votive offerings. <laughs> this is following the work of people like um, Walter Torbrugger on the continent and uh, Richard Bradley uh, in this country, who've really sort of looked at this, nest, this complete group of material um, and decided perhaps that votive offerings does give us perhaps one plausible explanation. But there are all sorts of votive. There's all sorts of different motivations uh, behind the deposition of stuff in the river, and I've listed a few here. Now, the problem about this, of course, is that um, in terms of prehistory, we don't have any, there's no records. We have no idea what the motivations were behind a lot of the deposition of this stuff in the river. We've got odd little sort of glimpses. Uh, Roman authors tell us that um, um, the Celts in Gaul would uh, offer objects into lakes and springs. Um, we've got um, the marking of boundaries. Um, I'll come on to that in a minute. Various other ones down here, tournaments of value, this whole business of competitive destruction of property by sort of potlatch, this sort of um, northwestern uh, American Indian uh, approach to um, competition by simply bigging yourself up by destroying publicly a lot of very fine stuff. It's the, I suppose it's the equivalent of you know, Keith Moon driving his white rolls into a swimming pool. Why do you do that? Well, because you can. And it shows that you've got the money to be able to do it. So those are the sort of motivations behind potlatch, perhaps. Disposable of powerful or tainted objects. And 
Plication of elemental forces. And I want to come back to plication of elemental forces at the end. But we have no, as I say, no clear indication in prehistory as to what the motivations were behind these objects, uh, the deposition of these objects. I'll give you a couple of um, ones that we do know a little bit more about. For example, the marking of boundaries and crossings. Now, there's an interesting um, estate boundary description in a charter um, dated AD 957 from Battersea. Um, John, John will know this very well indeed, John Clark, um, because he's been in close correspondence with um, Rob Briggs over this. Um, but part of that estate boundary description says that the uh, boundary can be established in a long stream as far as a man may throw a sword and a freeman five barleycorns. So here you've got a very clear uh, documented uh, evidence of uh, a boundary being established by throwing stuff into a stream. And I think, John, you, you had another one, a rather nice one, about someone riding into the river on horseback and throwing a spear into, into the stream, and as far as he threw, that established the boundary of the, of the holding. And of course, um, with, 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 a, with a Battersea estate boundary, I couldn't resist putting in the Bergnoth Saxe, which is this sort of 10th century um, uh, incredible piece of uh, metalwork which came out of the Thames at Battersea. Um, interestingly, sold to the British Museum by a um, chap called Briggs, who was the same man who sold the BM, the Battersea Shield. And I suspect that the Bergnoth Saxe and the Shield came out of the same dredging operation. This went to the BM in 1857, I think it was, and I think the Battersea Shield was there in 1854 or 55. But it was, it was part of this whole business of, of um, building um, Chelsea Bridge, or Battersea Bridge as it now is. So you've got this bit of, bit of documentation here. That might be one possible explanation for some of this stuff going into river to establish a boundary. Another one, very, very interesting one, this. This is, uh, these two gentlemen are Thomas Cobden Sanderson on the right in the plus fours, and his business partner, Emery Walker, on the left, the man with the Gladstone bag and the, uh, and the rather shifty-looking raincoat. <laughs> These two chaps um, were part of the Morris group, and they set themselves up as the Dove's Press in 1900 to print bespoke copies of things like the Bible, um, Shakespeare, Chaucer, the classics, but in, in beautiful type, in beauti beautiful type, designed by Cobden Sanderson. He was a bookbinder and a printer and a sort of antiquarian. Well, they set the firm up in 1900, fell out in about 1906, uh, had a big falling out, had a legal separation in 1909. The legal separation said that Cobden Sanderson could retain the type during his lifetime. Once he died, that type would then revert to Emery Walker to do with as he would. 1916, we're in the height of the First World War. Cobden Sanderson is not well. He can't bring himself to leave that type to his estranged business partner. So what does he do? He fills his pockets with type. <coughs> in the dark, walks half a mile to Hammersmith Bridge and throws the type into the river. He does this 170 times. <laughs> he disposes of a tonne and a half of type, and it's all in the riverbed off Hammersmith Bridge. And some of it has been recovered in the last few years, and we've got some of it here still encrusted with river silts. So here we've got another potential motivation. You're taking out of circulation a valued uh, object. But a really, really interesting story. Really interesting story. Anyway, all that's by the by. That's kind of a throat-clearing exercise. I'll just have a quick plug. Let's get on to the case studies. Now, this is a very, very typical thing that comes in quite often. It's a flint ads, which this one, uh, found by James Ward, on the foreshore at um, Greenwich, uh, in, um, in sort of East London. Now, if I show you, it's, a, it's quite a, a typical example of a flint adze. It would have been hafted, used for carpentry, felling trees, that sort of stuff. 
If we look at the distribution of these flint adzes along the river, here they are. I hope you can all see that, um, because I've tried to make these dots really big so they stand out. Anyway, here are the classic stretches of the river, and you'll, any, any sort of object you care to come up with will have broadly the same sort of distribution. So from Kingston all the way down to the city, that is really, really heavy, solid finds. From places like Kirkton, Kingston, you've got Brentford, uh, Mortlake, Hammersmith, Wandsworth, uh, Battersea, Chelsea, and then up to Westminster. Those are absolute classic reaches for production of material. But his find is coming out down here in the sort of downstream of the city stretches, which don't traditionally tend to produce a huge amount of stuff. If we factor in um, the new stuff that's coming, coming across, you can see that the, the thrust of the stuff is beginning to look further downstream. We're, we're, expanding, we're expanding the distribution of these objects. Uh, here, here's, his, here's his little ads down here. And there are others from sort of, you know, Deptford and Limehouse and places like that. Now, over the last few years, though, we've begun to get much more of a grip on what this all might mean in terms of its topographic significance. And these stars are all archaeological interventions. And I want to focus a little bit on this area downstream of um, Greenwich and the Isle of Dogs. Isle of Dogs is in here. We're on sort of Blackwall and round through uh, up towards um, uh, sort of Purfleet and beyond, Erith and, and beyond. If we look at this um, as an area, now this is a slide that Graham Spur showed at the Lammas conference just a few weeks ago. Uh, and what geoarchaeology is doing here is providing us with a series of transects. And this is from borehole data and from geoarchaeological data recovered during major programs like um, Crossrail, for instance. What uh, uh, Graham and his colleagues have been able to do is to use that data to begin, begin to build a topographic template. And that topographic template allows prediction to take place. So, for example, we've got a whole series of north-south transects you can see here. Graham and co. have put this stuff together to produce a sort of transect across the geology and the archaeology, as it says there, of the sort of early Holocene floodplain, if you like. And you can see two things immediately. You've got gravel highs, as it says here. Those are the areas between channels which will become islands or ayats later in the Holocene. Uh, and these are obviously high points, high gravel points. And you've got gravel lows, the bits where the gravel dips away. And these essentially will then go on to form parts of braided channels. So you've got, what you've got here is essentially um, a, a Holocene landscape beginning to emerge. The sort of picture that we might imagine in our mind's eye is something like this. This is a modern river in Alaska. But what you've got here are a series of braided channels interspersed by ayats, islands, sandbars, all sorts of very interesting places where people might want to settle or might be able to settle. And very clearly, the work that's beginning to go ahead there has identified a number of places that are worth looking for, are worth looking at within that sort of context. So this bottom plan is the kind of topographic template which has been built up through all that borehole data. And you can see the white areas are highs. They're the local highs, if you like islands or islets, on which you could readily anticipate finding, given survival and all the rest of it, you could readily anticipate finding um, early sites. These are, these are local highs within a, within a floodplain environment. And blow me, these two have both produced the, you know, the, the, the proper data. This is Custom House School, down here, uh, just to the north of the docks, and this is Fords Park Road, Dagenham, just up there, sitting just sort of south of the A13. The A13 is kind of running along here. Here's the Lee, running up the Lee Valley, and of course the Thames running there with the docks. <coughs> so we're beginning to get a grip on the background, the, 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 the sort of context within a lot of those river, within which a lot of those river finds have been made. 
Here's uh, Ford's Park Road, Dagenham, and again, a classic, here's the, here's the cross section, you're on, a, you're on a gravel high, or at the point where the gravel high is beginning to dip down into a channel, and it's that interface between the high and the channel where you tend to find settlement accruing during the Mesolithic. And that's exactly what Mola found at Ford's Park Road. Um, here's some work going on on the edge of the gravel highs. It's dipping away into the channel. Three-dimensionally recorded uh, material. A whole series of little late Mesolithic geometric microliths. Those are the red dots on the distribution plan here. These, these are metre squares, basically. Uh, divided up into metre squares with a distribution of microlithic sort of armatures, if you like, the red dots, uh, the arrow tips and barbs, and the black dots, which are the microburins. Those are the waste from, make, from making microliths. If you then, I haven't done it here, but if you then factored in the burnt flint, the flint that is not worked but burnt, that also sits just about in there it gives you the opportunity to try and recreate a bit, of a, a bit of a narrative here. And if you wanted a narrative, this might give you um, a half area around which people are sitting, around which people are gossiping, talking, exchanging information, retooling, getting ready to go on another hunting expedition. Um, and a rather nice little reconstruction of one such group by Faith Vardy. So you can begin to see how we're, we're beginning to sort of move away now from, the, from the, just the bog standard stuff out of the river and move up into the sort of hinterland, up reconnecting the river finds with the land finds, with the landward material. Another site, also on a topographic high, um, which turned up part of, as part of Crossrail, is at, um, at North Woolwich Portal. And this, um, this is where I really... <laughs> I have to make an apology to Jackie Kiley because um, uh, we only recognise, we, 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 a lot of these flint flakes turned up, and there they are, you can see them distributed across this surface here. And I looked at these and I, I said, well look, these look to me as though someone's been making an axe or adds. These, this is axe and waste. Um, what we didn't have was the smoking gun, but we did find it when we looked at the sieved material, which had come through later in the day as these things happen. And we had the butt of one of these axes. So I was rather pleased that that was... Um, I, I gave myself a little bit of a pat on the back for, for having anticipated this was axe-making debris before we found the axe. But this archaeological information is beginning to sort of fill out that mass of heaving mass of stuff coming out of the river. The stuff that doesn't have, often doesn't have good provenance doesn't have good location, doesn't have any sort of context other than it's come out of the river. But we can now begin to visualise groups of people sitting in that floodplain on, on local topographic highs, living, moving through. Sort of, um, we, we can begin to sort of look at, look at them um, as, as people rather than just groups of material. We can begin to populate the, the archaeology, if you like. Now... So this is very important in terms of establishing topography and getting a predictive model together. So you can begin to see, if you've got a local topographic high, there's a good chance you're going to have archaeology that'll, that'll sit with it. OK, let's look, let's look at case study two. This is Andy Johansson. And you, <coughs> before you start, you can oh, yes. you have the door open. It's terrible. It is, oh, yes, you're right. It is quite warm, isn't it? so much. I'm so sorry that? to interrupt. That's all right. No, not at all. I was, yes, <laughs> feeling a bit warm myself, so thank you. Um, is, is that, that's okay for people now, is it? Yes. Um, here we've got Andy Johansson. He's holding in his hands a rather splendid iron dagger encased in a wooden sheath, which he's found on the Thames foreshore at Chambers Wharf, uh, Rotherhithe, on the south bank of the Thames. This is a particularly interesting object. Um, he bought it in a few years ago. It's undergone conservation now. Here it is, an X-ray of it. It's, it's in life, it's about yay big. It's quite, it's a sort of a long dagger, short sword, if you like. Drawing the object before conservation showed, caught in the sort of mineral, mineralized deposits 
a whole series of what looked like the negative remains of punched dots within metal plates, which were no longer there. The metal plates had fallen off, been eroded away by the river, but enough survived in the mineralised remains caught behind those to show that what we had here was um, a, a bronze sheathed dagger, much like this one here from, I think this one's Mortlake, I think that's a Mortlake one. This one's certainly Mortlake. This one is interesting, though, because the um, wooden sheath, which was made of two sheets of, of um, ash wood, gave us a radiocarbon date. And the radiocarbon date comes out at 810 to 550 Cal BC. So it's a, it's a sort of... Well, we would... if Before we had the dates, we thought this would be a sort of Hallstatt object. So we thought it would be 7th, 6th century BC. So it was very nice to have radiocarbon confirmation. And this was part of the Technologies of Enchantment dating project, which um, Duncan Garrow and other <coughs> colleagues from Reading put together. Interestingly, though, we tried to date again. This is also a wooden sheathed, bronze-bound dagger. This is a classic one that you see in all the textbooks. It comes from the Thames at Mortlake. I think it's on the front cover of Barry Cunliffe's Iron Age Communities. The radiocarbon date, though, came back as 880 to 1000 Cal AD. The suggestion is, or one suggestion that was made by Duncan and, and colleagues, was that this might have been resheathed in the late Saxon period. Now, I, I don't know what John would make of that. I mean, it seems a slightly unlikely suggestion. I mean, the, the, the dagger itself is probably um, Middle European, and no problem with it being um, Hallstatt, sort of early Iron Age, Likewise, the construction of the sheath with these bronze bands is very clearly of a piece with these other uh, similar daggers. But that date is, is rogue. But they're absolutely convinced, it's 95% confidence, that that date is a true date. So there's a, there's, a, a, there's a question mark over that. But happily, not over the Bermondsey one. That's a, that's a nice date. That's a good date. Now, if we look at the distribution of these daggers... We can see again those, those same stretches of the river coming very much to the fore, except we're moving a little bit downstream now. Here's our, here's our Bermondsey dagger here. Here's our Mortlake dagger there. And you can see that we've got a good distribution here, particularly in these stretches between, say, Hammersmith and Wandsworth, and round up again towards Battersea and Chelsea. That's the heart of it. Now... This represents about 80%, 85% of these daggers known from the country. They all come, or 80, 80 or 80% of them, come from these West London stretches of the river. Again, it's these classic stretches of the river upstream of the city. But in this area in particular, I want to look at these two from Putney down here, on the foreshore at Putney. These have come in just recently or well, fairly recently, the one on the left, now I'm reliably informed um, by George Mashall, this was, this was found on Christmas Day. Mm. Christmas Day. Somebody was out on the foreshore on Christmas Day escaping from the kids <laughs> and the turkey. And they found this up against Putney Bridge. This is a slightly later dagger, probably dating to the 4th or 3rd centuries BC, so a bit later than the... Uh, let's go back. The black ones... Are the, are the Hallstatt daggers. These are the early daggers, the sort of 6th, 5th. These red ones, the Laten one, they're sort of 4th, 3rd. So our two from Putney, or our one from Putney, this one here, is also probably 4th, 3rd. Just a bit downstream, um, just after boat race day, actually, a few years ago, came this iron dagger. And when it was found, it was bent into an S shape and had been straightened out. This particular, this is a sword, actually, bent from Gournay in, in northern France, from these northern French sanctuaries. But the, the little Putney dagger, which again is about, about that big in life, was bent into an S-shape. Now, it's quite interesting. We've got some, some very intriguing finds coming from that same stretch. And I owe this slide, actually, to John Clark, this, this map showing the position of medieval bridges and ferry locations in the Thames. Clearly, we've got London Bridge here, 
And we've got Kingston Bridge there. Ooh, oh dear, no, I shouldn't have done that. There we go. I must touch the screen. Um, so we've got two bridges there. Big stretch in between, served during the medieval period by ferries, principally. Very, very important ferry that plied between uh, Fulham and Putney. Mentioned in Doomsday Book. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the fairs were split between the Bishop of London on the North Bank and the Manor of Wimbledon on the South Bank. So it's a very, very important crossing point. Um, it's still, um, it was the first bridge to be built between London Bridge and Kingston Bridge in the 1720s. That was the first bridging point after the medieval period. So it's a really, really key crossing point. And I'm still told, uh, I'm told rather, that Putney Bridge is still the busiest bridge for cross-channel traffic. So it's clearly a very, very interesting and important point at which the river can be crossed. It has attracted that same stretch some remarkable objects, including these two very fine shield bosses, which probably also date to the 4th to 3rd centuries BC, something like that. Um, this is the famous, the, the, the better known of the two, the circular um, bronze shield boss with two waterfowl. You can see the head of one there, the head of the other there, and then wings and webbed feet. Often interpreted, well certainly interpreted by Professor Jope, as perhaps representing swans in flight. The other one, the long one, is probably best known for this little weird face, but it too has a couple of water birds, a couple of heads of water birds, which may or may, or may not be swans. So we've got major groups of Iron Age, posh Iron Age metalwork. These are really, really important pieces of, of, uh, uh, of Iron Age metalwork. We've also, in the last few years, begun to see a very large number of small objects of, of similar sort of 4th, 3rd, 2nd century BC date. This one is rather nice. Known, you'll not be surprised to hear, as the little bronze bra. <laughs> um, but essentially what it is, is part of one of these knobbed bracelets, which are usually of sort of Eastern and Central European distribution. Um, and it looks as though we've got a sort of homemade version going into the river just downstream of Putney Rail Bridge. We've got a whole series of brooches as well of 4th to probably 4th to 3rd to 2nd uh, century BC date um, from Putney, from Wandsworth and also round up towards Hammersmith. Um, and Sophie Adams, who's done her PhD on these, um, was very kindly, uh, kind enough to supply me with some pictures. So... Um, thank you to her for that. Now, the other thing, of course, that has come up recently are two bits of skull, both from that same stretch of river. The one that Jane is holding there uh, at the bottom of the slide that she and I have just dug out of the foreshore is an adult male. And you've got the date there, 390 to 200 Cal BC. This chap seems to have had a bump on the head. He's got some blunt injury trauma on his, on his head. The other one, the top one here, found by, by George in the, in the fourth row there, is small. It's only about that big. It's a child's skull. But look at the date. 315 to 205 Cal BC. Only okay at 57.5% confidence. But there's a broad overlap between those dates. There's a broad overlap between those dates and the metalwork that's coming out of the river down there. Um, between sort of Putney Wandsworth. If we put all these bits together and think about what we might be dealing with here, Pamela Greenwood, who's done a lot of work down on that foreshore, uh, Nick Fuentes before her, uh, and the Wandsworth Historical Society, have done a huge amount of work, mudlarking work, down on that foreshore between sort of Putney and Wandsworth. Pam's suggestion is that what you may have down on the foreshore there is the remains of an eroding eight. One of three, possibly, that she thinks she can detect from using sort of uh, map regression. Um, and if you, certainly if you go down on that foreshore, there is, there is quite a ridge. There is quite a ridge down there. Whether it's, a, whether it's an eroding eight, I don't know. But it's, it's an interesting story which might begin to tie together 
some of the objects. The two yellow spots are our skulls, and the two green spots are our daggers. The ones were the other small finds, the little bronze, eight, the little, the bronze bra, and all the other brooches and things are coming from this sort of downstream end of that putative eight, and a lot more besides off the stream to left and right. You go over the river on the north bank, just upstream of, uh, uh, of Fulham Bridge, you see this, a group of three posts driven into the foreshore. Look at the dates. 510 to 380, 520 to 390, 480 to 380, all Cal BC, all at 95%. There's some sort of Iron Age structure, early to middle Iron Age structure on the north bank of the river. And we're looking south, here's, here's Fulham, here's uh, Putney Bridge rather, and the area of foreshore where the skulls came from and the other pieces is down there on the other side of the river. And I think that might be you, Yvonne. Is that right? Yes. Looks like you. Yes. yes. Gazing at the, one of the posts. <coughs> These came up as part of the Thames Discovery Programme. The dates are really, really interesting. So what we're beginning to see here is quite a tight grouping of dates into the Iron Age from perhaps, say, the, the 7th through to the 2nd century BC. Now, just hold that for a moment. Let's move a little bit further upstream to a site at the confluence of the Beverly Brook and the Thames. Uh, where are we? Yes, here we are. We're looking sort of up, upstream, as it were. The Thames is over here behind these trees. Uh, the, what were formerly the reservoirs, now the Wildlife Wetland Trust, is sort of just beyond those playing fields. These two slides here taken by the Wandsworth Historical Society back in 1974, have identified a number of Middle Iron Age features. Um, here's Pan, actually. There's a, a young Pan digging part of that trench in 1974. The ladies in the foreground here are in a Middle Iron Age pit, which is producing pottery and a bronze terret ring, or part of a bronze terret. The pottery is probably Middle Iron Age in date, probably 300, something like that. There seems to be some um, uh, sort of particular forms, particular fabrics, which we can date, sort of glauconitic fabrics, dating sort of post-300. That's more or less there. That's in that muddy patch that's been backfilled. Just further upstream, in this sand area up here, was another uh, interesting deposit, including three half-querns, one of which comes from Folkestone, one from Lodsworth, and one from Spilsby in, in Lincolnshire. All three have been burnt, and all three look as though they've been placed quite deliberately in a, in a context. Now, the interesting thing about all this, of course, is, as part of Thames Tideway Tunnel, the same site, the self-same site, is being looked at by Mola at the moment, being evaluated by Mola, and they, again, not surprising in view of what Pamela and her colleagues found in the 70s, is also, they're also producing Middle Iron Age material. Stratified Middle Iron Age material out of pits and ditches. We've got clearly some sort of settlement context here at the cusp, at the, at the confluence of the, of the Beverly with the Thames. We've also, quite interestingly, got a number of very, very long flint blades, which I think are probably Upper Paleolithic in date, might even be Creswellian. Uh, so really, really interesting stuff is beginning to emerge. The Thames Tideway Tunnel, the TTT project, looks as though it might begin to get a bit of a grip on what's going on in this Beverly Thames confluence. If we put all these bits together, pile supposition upon supposition, and look at, say, things like the distribution of Iron Age coins in that same area. Now, John Kent, 40 years ago, suggested on the distribution of Gallo-Belgic B gold that there was, must have been some fairly high status um, settlement somewhere in the West London region. The red dots are these Gallo-Belgic B coins. And you can see how they, how they sort of shift sort of down through this area here. Now John uh, very carefully didn't suggest where such a, where such a complex might lie. But you begin to wonder, these, these coins, by the way, this, here's one of these Gallo-Belgic B defaced status, and I, I thank um, 
uh, Jackie and Ros for sourcing this for me. Um, these date to the middle, middle to late second century BC. So say sort of 150 through to sort of 100 there or thereabouts. If you factor in then the potin coins, these, these base cast uh, tin bronze issues, dating from around about 120 through to about 50 or 60 BC, they too begin to cluster. These hordes, anyway, begin to cluster in those same stretches of the river, including several little hordes at that same point on the foreshore at the mouth of the Beverly with the Thames, including this little group, this, this little horde, uh, um, uh, a uniface stator and a little quarter stator, these are probably being issued by the Ambiani in the 50s BC. And the general suggestion is that these are, being, these are gold issues being used to pay British mercenaries in their fight against Caesar. The earlier stuff may have been emergency issues by the Nervii, perhaps, again, attempting to pay or paying British mercenaries to help them combat Germanic tribes coming across the Rhine. So we've got emergency issues of coins. I mean, that's all by the by. But it's the distribution is quite interesting. And I just wonder if we're going to get some more information from the work that the TTT, uh, MOLA, are doing ahead of the TTT program. And there's still, there's still finds coming in from that same stretch off the foreshore. Uh, more coins, uh, potent coins in particular. Now, if we put all that together... Here's a sort of composite plan of what, what looks as though is happening down there. Here's our crossing point, our ferry point, somewhere down here, probably just downstream of modern um, Putney Bridge. We've got this high-status metalwork just going into the river, perhaps just downstream of that ayat on the, on the, uh, the Putney-Wandsworth border. We've got a whole series of um, bits of archaeology here are those two sites that Pamela looked at in the 70s. Pamela and Nick looked at in the 70s. This one down here, and all of that area through there is going to be evaluated as part of Thames Tideway Tunnel. So that gives us a real opportunity to get a grip on what's going on down there. We've got other spectacular finds out of the river. We've got this curious cruciform um, bronze um, shield boss coming out of the Thames at Crabtree, just upstream. We've got the famous... Um, Gladius with the uh, Romulus and Remus um, bronze plates out of the Thames at Fulham. This is one of the very few objects that Leighton allowed out of his possession during his lifetime. We've got a whole series of archaeological sites in and around sort of King Street Hammersmith, including a large double ditched enclosure whose middle silts contain Middle Iron Age pottery, including this rather nice little decorated bowl. And we've got a big Saxon settlement at Hammersmith there. We've got Fulham Palace down here, these earthworks around the Bishop's Palace. And we've got Iron Age, uh, Roman settlement activity under Putney. Now, that's all beginning to look kind of interesting. But whether we can make the leap and say, well, look, perhaps we have found John Kent's West London Oppidum is quite another matter. So I, I put that out there. But when you actually begin to look at all the material, to try and contextualise it, you can begin to see that there's a bit of a possible picture beginning to emerge here. High status metalwork, perhaps going into the river, off, a, off, a, off an eroding eight. Other eights, which Pamela has identified, possibly somewhere, uh, where are we, just in there, and also up there, from early map, from early cartographic evidence. Not always reliable, I have to say, the cartographic evidence, but it's, it's a kind of straw in the wind. Then if we widen the picture right out um, to look at Caesar and the crossings of the river, various crossing points have been suggested for Caesar. Everyone's had a go. <laughs> Westminster, Chelsea, Putney Fulham, Brentford, Kingston and the Coway Stakes down at Walton. Now, the Coway Stakes have always been the favourite after Camden suggested this was where, following Bede, where Caesar might have crossed. Montague Sharp was a great champion of Brentford, which he described as the Great Ford. 
But I just wonder if we can't begin to make a case for the sort of Fulham Putney area. The, the geology kind of works. Um, but there's some, well, anyway, some interesting ideas un being unpacked here. Then we've got some very high status sites downstream of the city, like Upple Camp on the roading. Big site, 48 acre site, mostly now under suburban housing and a chemicals factory. And of course, we've got the Woolwich Arsenal, which again, the geology, you've got the gravel approaching the, the riverbank there, and this big double ditched enclosure <coughs> cutting off a, a chunk of gravel. And here's one of, the, one of the sections through one of the ditches. These are enormous ditches, absolutely enormous ditches. The problem we've got, of course, is that Caesar, coming through here in the 50s, doesn't mention any settlements in the London area. But if we actually look at the coin evidence, it's very likely that these settlements were probably falling out of use, perhaps in the 80s or the 70s, or perhaps even as late as the 60s BC, so pre-Caesar, which may be why they're not mentioned by him. But I, I, the, other, the other thing I do wonder about this Woolwich site, it's a big, big double-ditched enclosure. And I wonder if it's to keep people in rather than keep people out. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I, we, we hear a lot of talk about, you know, um, Strabo and slaves, British slaves being shipped out. And you just wonder if one or two of these sites might have something to do with slaving. Um, but I have no evidence on which to base that at all. That's just a piece of kite flying. But I just wonder if, if, if there's something to be looked at there. So, there's all sorts of kind of interesting ideas floating about here, which, which are worth pursuing, uh, well, I think are worth pursuing, um, including that sort of Putney-Fulham stretch. Anyway, you'll not be um, sad to hear that this is the third of the, the three. Chat walks into the BM, Jake Rylance. He's been walking on the foreshore at Nine Elms Putney. He goes into Stuart Needham, I found this... This. Is it, is it anything? It was sticking up out of the mud, and I put my finger in it and put, pulled it out, and that came up with it. Stuart said, yes, it's, it's a side-looped Middle Bronze Age spearhead, probably dating to the 14th or 13th centuries BC. They often turn up in pairs. Why don't you pop back and see if you can find the second one? <laughs> so he <we> did. <laughs> this one, again, side-looped spearhead, same sort of date, in the mineralised concretions caught within the eyes of the sockets there was some mineralised lime bass string, which may have been the, re the, 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 the means of attaching it to its shaft or possibly tying the two of them together. Because he then said, oh, by the way, he said, I found those two spearheads amongst a load of old timbers. I don't suppose you'd be interested in looking at those. Stuart was straight down there with James Rackham here, and here are the timbers that they... Those spearheads were found amongst. Two lines apparently marching out into the channel, four metres apart. This is a big, big structure. Here it is, a sort of sideways view, and we're looking down towards obviously Battersea Power Station there. Now, there was quite a bit of discussion as to what date these timbers might be, um, and various people thought, well, they might be Saxon, because they're round wood, or they might be prehistoric. We had two of them dated, and they came back with those dates there. So early stroke Middle Bronze Age, essentially. Um, the spearheads are probably 14th, 13th century BC, so that ties in kind of nicely with what's going on here. What would something like this be doing on the river down there? The suggestion is that this may be some major structure going out perhaps to a midstream island, to a midstream ayat, long since dredged away. So we're not necessarily looking at this, a bridge spanning the river, but perhaps something that's hopping across to an ayat, on which various functions could have been happening. <laughs> this is what we think the thing might have looked like if we reconstructed it. This is what might have been going on on that, uh, on that raised platform, stuff going into the river. Now, there are a number, at the time this came up, there weren't too many parallels around, but we've now got quite a few. They've, they've begun popping out of the ground all over the shop. There's this one here from Testwood Lakes down near Southampton at Totten. 
This has been dendro dated to the 1450s BC. Uh, it's about a two metre wide structure associated with this Middle Bronze Age rapier. And the artist's reconstruction there looks, to my mind, looks very, very neat and very engineered. I'm not sure it'd be quite that neat or that engineered. So we've got that one there. We've got a whole series of bridges at Eton Dorney, the rowing lake under the International Rowing Course. Uh, where Oxford Archaeology, I think there are five or six of these things, dating from the Middle Bronze Age through to the Iron Age. But these ones were associated with some human remains. This is quite interesting. We've got skulls and long bones going into the river, upstream of the bridges. Now if we look at the distribution of ten skulls, human skulls from the river, here's our, here's our Vauxhall site, and you can see, again, the usual distribution coming through, those upriver up reach, up reaches of the Thames. So we've got major concentrations of skulls from places like Strand on the Green, uh, from Mortlake, um, from Wandsworth, and also this very famous one here uh, from Chelsea. And this is what led Sire Cuming to dub that particular reach Celtic Golgotha, because the number of skulls that were coming out of the river. We've got a couple of Trepan skulls as well, one from Hammersmith, and this one here from Chelsea, and that's got a date of, I think it's about 1700 Cal BC, something like that, so, so early Bronze Age. But this chap has had a hole drilled in his head. Um, while still alive, he survived, and, his, and the bone is growing across. So he, he, he came through it alive. How am I doing for time? Have I gone way over? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. Um, interesting. I... I Completely sidestep the skulls from the Walbrook. That's way beyond my pay grade. I'll leave that to the Romanists to sort out. Nothing to do with me, squire. I'll, I'll stick with the, with the skulls from the tent, a number of which have now been dated, many of which seem to date to the middle to late Bronze Age into the early part of the Iron Age. So we've got our two Putney ones going, extending that down into the sort of later middle to late Iron Age. Quite interesting. Now, if we look at the context of that Vauxhall structure, it sits here. It's hyd hydrologically very, very interesting because we've got former channels either side of Battersea Park. This is the so-called Battersea Channel, which is beginning to silt up. We've got the Tyburn Stream coming down from the north, and we've got the River Ephra coming in from the south, from sort of Kennington that way, and debouching in the Thames sort of here. So it's hydrologically really rather interesting. Work that Jane Siddell did as part of the Jubilee Jubilee Line Extension Project looked at the diatom information from the Westminster stretches, which is just up here, Thorny Island, sort of just off the map up there. And she's suggesting these, these, these diatoms come in three flavours. Uh, plain, salty, and brackish. <laughs> and the ones from Westminster appear... Is that brackish? Am I right? Yes? Yeah. Yes. The suggestion is that by the Middle Bronze Age, there are tidal influences coming up as far as Vauxhall, if not beyond. We don't have the information beyond, but at least as far as, at least as, far as Vauxhall. Now, this brings into play the, the notion of the tidal head and how important the tidal head was uh, as a sort of liminal place within the, within the channel, within the, within the valley. If we look at things as well, like mean tide levels, we can see that they begin to climb. This is, this is data from Thames, uh, 21, Thames Estuary 2100 survey. You can see the way the tidal levels are beginning to climb with the, with the suggestion that um, they're going to continue to climb with global warming, etc., into towards 2100, um, which may mean that the tidal levels are shifting anything between 0.3 of a metre and 2.7 metres. Um, so we're beginning to see estuarine expansion, if you like, um, happening now. Um, except we have all sorts of engineering solutions to that, don't we? We have things like the Greenwich Flood Barrier. But if you look at the Greenwich Flood Barrier, the number of times it's been opened, or clo sorry, closed, since, uh, since its opening in 1982, you can see that there are various spikes where well, we've had to close, the, the barriers had to be closed to stop storm surges coming up. 
with a big spike in 2013-2014, which takes us back to those pictures of the flooding that I showed you right at the start. If we took away the Greenwich flood barrier, this is what central London might regularly look like. This rather nice CGI image. That Greenwich flood barrier protects, uh, so, it's, so it's said in these papers, something like one and a quarter million people and 275 billion pounds worth of property. So it's a major engineering solution, a major engineering feat to actually protect London using um, engineering methods. Such methods weren't available in the Bronze Age, where we have estuarine expansion, we have rising mean sea level, as it were, or relative sea level. We also have this, this business of uh, the, the place name, Londinium. Um, now, um, there was some work done on this, uh, on this notion of, of um, what the origin of the word Londinium might mean. Um, and Richard... Um, thank you, Coates. <laughs> thank you, voice off. <laughs> Richard Coates, down at the University of Sussex, suggested that if you actually re-engineered Londinium and took it back, you would end up with a word which he'd invented. That's what the asterisk means. This is an invented word, plowonida. And he's suggesting that plowonida might mean something like um, flooding river, boat river, river that is difficult to cross. So what he's suggesting is there might have been two names for prehistoric, the prehistoric Thames, Tameza, the flowing one, the uh, non-tidal Thames, and Plawonida, the flooding one, the tidal Thames. And that that Plawonida name may have been a movable feast. The tide, as the, as the tidal head ratcheted backwards and forwards, changing um, through the Bronze Age, that that name attached to the tidal head. And it was only when the Romans established Londinium in the middle of the first century BC that that name was essentially nailed down to a settlement. And that settlement may have been placed there because that was then the current tidal head. So you could get ships in and out on the tide. Um, there's quite a lot of work been done by people like um, Gus Milne and um, um, Chap Marine Batterby, I think if it was, um, suggesting anyway that the tidal head was around the city stretches in the, in the, at the start of the Roman period. It then goes further out, uh, downstream, and then comes back in again. So the, this constant interplay with the tidal head, the position of the tidal head. Now, if you look at the archaeology, uh, the prehistoric archaeology of the stretches in and around the city uh, and downstream, you can begin to see we have what I've sometimes described as London's Leoness surfaces, lost landscapes which have disappeared between, beneath an expanding estuary in the Bronze Age. So we've got plough marks etched into the sand islands of Bermondsey, uh, being excavated here. We've got big expanses of drowned forest, like this one at Irith, which um, Elliot Ragg is sort of pointing at down there. And, of course, we've got a whole series of Bronze Age trackways um, across, thrown across the sort of um, floodplain downstream of the city in the sort of what, what become known as the sort of northeast London wetlands. This particular one, I think, is at Beckton. Um, it's a brushwood trackway, there's James Rackham again, um, in situ, um, running across here. Now, this one, you can see all that, that silting that's essentially come in, river silt. These are drowned landscapes. These communities don't have access to major engineering. They can't, they can't engineer a solution. What they can do, perhaps, is offer objects to the river. To, to go away. And some of the finest objects include these sort of metal uh, weapons, swords, rapiers, spearheads, etc. Um, this, is, this was from an old display we had in the museum some years ago, but they're still coming in. These finds are still coming in, and I show here two, two finds that have come in as part of the Portable Antiquities Scheme over the last four or five years. Um, a bit longer than that, actually, on, in this case. Really fine basal loop spearhead from the Thames at Brentford, and this complete uh, sword, late Bronze Age leaf shaped sword, also from the Thames at Brentford. 
So the stuff is still coming in. Um, but if you look at the distribution of that metalwork, and I show here a slide that, um, or a distribution plan that Stuart Needham and Colin Burgess put together back in all 1980. Looking at the distribution of metalwork from the, from the Pennard period, from about 1275 through to about 600, you can see the way the distributions of the metalwork change over time. But it's those same stretches of river which are involved, those same classic stretches of river, say, between Kingston and the city. Now, if you map that against flood zones, projected flood zones, modern flood zones, those same stretches lie at the sort of upstream limit of the, of the likely flooding areas. And I just put two and two together and made 19 as to whether or not the metalwork might represent some sort of um, environmental proxy. Now, this is where Jane has a coronary. Um, I did, I kind of floated this uh, at, a, at a seminar a few years ago now, that, or three or four years ago, that Stuart Needham was at. And in the discussion, he was um, quite obviously very quiet. And I said to him afterwards, I said, well, what did you, did you think there was anything to that? Did, what did you think? He said, um, well, I'm still thinking. So he didn't dismiss it. But I, I mean, Stuart chews things very thoroughly before coming to a conclusion. I must admit, I haven't taxed him with this again. Um, uh, well, I haven't liked to, actually, because I wouldn't have an end to a lecture. Um, but I just wonder whether there's something in this. Whether it's the tidal head and the, the propitiation of the tidal head by offering objects to the point at which the tide is turning. These are key areas within the river. Um, whether this might explain some of what we've, some of these distribution patterns that we've been looking at. And it does open up a whole interesting other series of subjects because a lot of the rivers that produce metalwork, like the Thames, like the Trent, like the Witham, are east flowing rivers. They're rivers affected by rising sea levels in the southern part of the North Sea Basin. And the same sort of phenomena are turning up on the continent, on the continental rivers. You're getting stuff going into the rivers um, at the points where the tide may turn. So it does look as though there might be a rather bigger picture here, a rather more interesting picture, which, um, which will require an awful lot more work before it can be kind of confirmed or denied. But it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we've put out there. Okay, right, uh, here we go. We're back to this chap. This is my last couple of slides. Um, this, to my mind, is the single <laughs> finest piece of um, lithic technology to come from the river in the last 30 years. It's absolutely fabulous. It's about that big. It's actually on display in the prehistoric gallery. It even has its own poem written to it. It was brought in by a chap who'd been out on the foreshore at Hammersmith. Uh, and he brought it in and he said, um, uh, I'd like to give this to the museum. Uh, and the museum said, well, thank you very much. Um, and he said, but before I do it, I want to take it on a road trip. I want to take it out. I want to, I want to show it its Neolithic roots. This is a, essentially, this is what, what this is, a proto sort of cushion mace head of, of sort of Neolithic date. What he did, he took it down to Stonehenge and brought it back, dressed up. Here's what it came back like. He did a fabulous job mounting it up with, with buzzard feathers and a carved sort of handle. Now, who's to say he's not, he's not wrong or he's not right? But he went down there for the summer solstice and took this out on a road trip and brought it back and rather stunned everybody at the museum, I think, when he brought this in. Um, they had it photographed and then dismounted. I rather like it, actually. It's a good piece of, a good piece of stuff. Anyway, a, re, a, a nice little sort of outro. I, I thank Jackie for sourcing that for me. I think you had to do all sorts of stuff, call in all sorts of favours to find the pictures. Um, right, just to finish with, here we go. Rumsfeld's rules. <laughs> <sighs> Rule number one when dealing with the press was to say, learn to say, I don't know. And what this, uh, what this lecture this evening has done is to demonstrate that I don't know. <laughs> but there are some interesting ideas that might be worth pursuing. And I would like to thank, 
a very large number of people for helping me source, as it says there, objects, images, and ideas. Thank you, too, for listening. If you enjoyed this talk, perhaps you'd like to join our society. Our membership start from £6 a year for students and £20 a year for individuals and includes a free copy of our transactions publication. See www.lamas.org.uk forward slash join hyphen lamas.html for more details.